friends, welcome again to Panorama of Prophecy, a Bible study spectacular. We want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. Also, of course, our local audience right here in Granite Bay, California. Good to see you this evening. We're working our way through some very important Bible prophecies. Tonight is an exciting topic. We're going to be studying about heaven, so we are glad that you are here. We also want to greet those who are live streaming this program all around the world. We've gotten some wonderful testimonies that have come in from people literally all over the place. As a matter of fact, I'm going to share a few of them. We have Valerie, and she's watching from Southern California. She says, I'm really enjoying these teachings. God bless everyone. Carolyn, who is watching from the island of Vanuatu in the South Pacific, says, I love the way Pastor Doug explains the Bible with so much enthusiasm and joy. And then here's an encouraging testimony. Shirley writes, she says, I'm watching the programs with my husband who has dementia. And when Pastor Doug called for a decision to accept Jesus, he responded and confessed. She says he hasn't been responsive for a very long time. So this was a very encouraging experience. She says, thank you and God bless. We're getting wonderful testimonies coming in around the world of people who are tuning in participating in the program. So friends, if you're watching and you've been blessed by the program, let us know. Just go to the Panorama of Prophecy website and you can send us a message. If you have a picture of your group, if you're meeting in a group, you can upload that picture. We'd love to see you and see what's happening around the world with the series. We do have a free book that we want to make available on the subject of heaven. It's called Heaven, Is It For Real? This is our free offer this evening. We'll be happy to send this a digital copy of the book to anyone who would like it just simply text the word heavenly to the number 40544 and of course if you're in North America we can send you the digital copy via text but if you're outside of North America just go to the Panorama of Prophecy website you'll be able to download a copy of the book heaven is it for real I want to remind you that we are translating each of these presentations into Spanish you'd like to get a live Spanish translation, just go to the Amazing Facts Latino Facebook or YouTube channel. We're also translating into sign language, American Sign Language, and that's at the Washington Conference YouTube channel. So if you'd like to uh, take advantage of that, just uh, take a look at that YouTube channel. Tonight's topic is entitled The Glorious Kingdom, and I hope you got your study notes that go along with the presentation. You should have received it when you came in. For those of you who are watching, you can download tonight's study guide at the Panorama of Prophecy website. Well, at this time, we're going to sing our theme song. We're going to invite John Lomacain and Kelly Maurer to lead us. So let's stand as we sing together, Help Me to Know Your Will. Help me to know your will, Lord, that I might follow thee. Make me to hear that still, small voice tenderly calling me. If wind and waves start mounting, peace the word, peace be still. Give me the mind of Jesus. Show me the truth that frees us. I want to do what pleases you, so help me to know your will. Lord, please help me to know your will. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, again, we are so grateful that we can gather together and open up your word and study about, well, the reward of the redeemed, the place that you are preparing for those that love you. Father, we are longing for the day when Jesus comes, when there'll be no more pain or sorrow or suffering. Forever we'll be with you and with those that love you. So, Lord, as we open up your word and study, we invite your presence and your spirit to guide us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. You know, one of the comments that we get is people write in and they're talking about the seminar. They say, we really enjoy the Bible questions section. I know it's one of my highlights to listen to the questions coming in and find Bible answers for them. Again, for those of you who are here, if you have a Bible question, you can write it down on the piece of paper. You should have a notepad. Just give it to one of the volunteers 
and they will turn it in and we're going to try and answer as many of those bible questions as possible for those of you who are watching online just go to the panorama of prophecy website you can post your bible question there and pastor doug and karen will take those questions try to answer as many of them as we can so we'd like to invite pastor doug and karen to come out at this time and we'll begin our bible questions thank you pastor ross hi friends how are you Good to see each of you here. Thank you for coming out. I want to welcome those who are watching the Panorama of Prophecy on TV. Am I supposed to be on this You're side? You're supposed to be on this side. Okay, thanks. Should we start the, the over? Mi the mic is on this side. You need to be on this side. <laughs> okay, there we Good go. Good evening, everybody. Hi. <laughs> okay, um, Hi. let's see. We got a lot of Bible questions. They're starting to come in. Starts with a trickle, turns to a tsunami, but we're going to cover as many as we can. All right. What is the testimony of Jesus that's mentioned in Revelation? When you look in Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, that's the last verse, talks about this battle between the dragon and the woman, and it says, the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed that keeps the commandments of God and has the testimony, testimony. of Jesus. And you think, well, what is the testimony of Jesus? It explains it right there in the book. If you go to Revelation chapter 19, verse 10, uh, John is telling, uh, the angel is telling John, do not bow down and worship me. He says, I am of your brethren, the prophets, worship God, for the um, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. When it says the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus, you've got um, all through the Bible reference to, uh, like Isaiah chapter 8, 20, it says, to the law and to the testimony. Commandments, testimony. The Law and the Prophets, same phrase. Last two uh, statements in the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, remember the Law of Moses, behold, I send you Elijah the Prophet, the Law and the Testimony. The Law and the Prophets is a phrase for the Word of God in the Bible. All right. Does God withdraw His protection from us because we sin, or does our sin cause God to withdraw? Well, it's not an easy question to answer cut and dry. When you've given yourself to the Lord, uh, God is not, he doesn't immediately abandon you if you make mistakes. I can see places in the Bible where, you know, even some of uh, the kings, they loved the Lord and they made mistakes and he still gave them victory in battle. Even Ahab, who was a wicked king, God says, I'm fighting for you uh, in this one battle against Syria uh, because he says they're trusting in their gods and, and uh, you know, you're supposed to be trusting in me. So, you know, God in his goodness takes care of us sometimes even when... Uh, we're forgetting God, uh, but I think we make it more difficult for God to station angels around us when we are deliberately doing evil. It's almost like we're inviting uh, trouble. I think it, it, uh, it, we have limited protection when we're walking away from God, kind of venturing on Satan's ground. It's much more dangerous. I hope that made sense. So um, God does watch over his children but uh, we get into more trouble when we go into a far country and wander from God. Yeah, so we're better off committing Stay, our lives to him yes. day by day and moment by moment at He'll times. He'll give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all of thy ways, and they'll watch over us. This question is kind of similar to the one we just had. Can you have a percentage of the Holy Spirit, or is it more like you have the Holy Spirit or you don't? Yeah, well, I don't think you're going to see people with a meter on their head like a battery on your laptop that says, oh, I'm at 50% today. <laughs> but it is true, biblically, that people do seem to have different quantities of filling with the Spirit. For example, it's the Holy Spirit that convicts you of sin and makes you turn to Jesus. But it wasn't until Christ went to heaven and Pentecost happened that he baptized the disciples in the Holy Spirit. Uh, David had the Holy Spirit when he prays in Psalm 51. He says, Lord, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. When Samson fought a lion, it says, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Well, he, he had additional strength when he was fighting lions and Philistines. And so you see the Holy Spirit seems to come into our lives in waves as needed. And to the same extent we empty ourselves, to that extent God can fill us with his Spirit. You know, we humble ourselves before the Lord and he will lift us up. Do we know how long the time of trouble will last? How long will we not be able to buy or sell? You know, we could only speculate. In the Bible, there's two kinds of times of trouble. You've got this great tribulation. Um, Christ said there's no time like it. Uh, he, you read this in Matthew 24, Daniel chapter 12. Um, unlike any other time, 
uh, nor will there be any after the terrible time of trouble when the seven last plagues fall. Prior to that, and when the seven last plagues fall, probation has closed. The saved are saved, the lost are lost. But prior to that, there's a period where before the death decree of Revelation 13, so you cannot buy or sell. And they're going to try and use this uh, economic pressure to manipulate uh, people into surrendering their convictions. How long that will be? Well, I don't think the seven last plagues are going to last very long. It seems to say in Revelation, it says all of her plagues will come in a day. Now, a day biblically is a year, and that means within a year's time, it doesn't mean it'll even be a full year, but it all happens within one year, the seven last plagues. And even the plagues that fell on Egypt, that all happened in a matter of months. The calamities that came on Job, it happened in a matter of weeks. And so it's going to be very intense, but I think it's going to be very concentrated. Jesus said, except those days be shortened, no flesh would be saved. How long will the small time of trouble be? I, I don't know, you know. I'm just guessing it, it'd be a couple, few years. We don't know. But it's not, it, there's no dates in the Bible. It doesn't give us a time if frame. If there are, I haven't spotted it yet. So I'm, I am reluctant to mention it. Now, let, let me just mention something. Um, how many of you have heard of the seven years of tribulation? Where is that verse in the Bible? There is no verse in the Bible that says seven years of tribulation. That is assumed because they take this one week in Daniel chapter 9, and that day is a year in prophecy, and then they put that down at the end of time, and they assume that's the seven years. Or some say, well, Noah was in the ark for seven days before the flood came, and then they turn that into seven years of tribulation. There's really no specific verse that says the great time of trouble is seven years. Can you imagine seven years where the ocean is blood and all the fresh water is blood and men are scorched with great heat? And I don't think it's going to be that long. All right. How can we know what is symbolic, figurative, or literal in the book of Revelation? For example, there's forever, everlasting, eternal, never-ending, and forever and ever. Well, those phrases, they mean what they say. Uh, there are places in the Bible, we just talked about the plagues, and uh, you just, you read them in the context. The plagues that fell on Egypt were real plagues. We have every reason to believe that when God talks about these last plagues that fall, that they are also real plagues. Uh, but, you know, when the Bible says there's a dragon, and you know that that's a symbol in the Bible for the devil, and you read about a lamb, you know, that's a symbol in the Bible for Christ. And it says the dragon wants to devour the man-child that the woman is bringing forth. That woman is the church. Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church. I've likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and a delicate woman. These are passages all through the Bible that say that the church is the bride of Christ. So you apply the Bible symbols. Well, yeah. So I was going to say something uh, special I should mention is for those who are here, and I think it's also available to those who are viewing, there is a Bible symbol chart we're going to be sharing Friday night that you'll be getting as part of your material. It's going to tell you what those symbols are. Do we know what Jesus looked like when he was a man here on this earth? What we know is that he must have looked very much like the other people in his community because he seemed to disappear in a crowd pretty well. <laughs> uh, even when Judas betrayed him, the religious leaders said, you show us which one he is, because uh, Jesus looked like the people that came from Galilee. And um, so sometimes they wanted to take up stones to stone him, and he just slipped through the crowd. He could, when he went down to some of the feasts, he went with everybody else, and the Bible says he went secretly. Well, he was in a crowd, but, you know, they didn't have television back then. They didn't have photographs, and people weren't uh, emailing pictures of Jesus. Some people knew him, and they knew what he looked like. What changed the world about Jesus is not what he looked like, it's what he said. Mm -hmm. You read in Isaiah 53, he has no form or comeliness that we should desire him. In other words, Jesus may not have looked like, you know, a movie star. He looked like a normal person. What he said is what transformed the world. We know nothing about what he looked like. What we do know is what he said. Do you think that was just so that we would focus on his words and not be caught up in his looks or his appearance? Yeah, and also because uh, the Lord is pretty clear he doesn't want us making idols or images. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if there's a lot of very detailed description about his appearance, you'd have statues like Buddha of Jesus everywhere. All right. Why were there three crosses at Calvary? Well, you read that he was crucified. There were two other male factors. There were two other criminals that were two 
Three were to be executed that day, Barabbas and two thieves that were his accomplices, and Jesus died between them, but that's also very symbolic because on the right and the left of Jesus, you've got the destiny of everybody here. We're all guilty like those thieves. We can do nothing to save ourselves. Both wanted to be saved, but one repented and confessed, the other did not. And so on one side of Jesus, I'd like to assume it's on the right side, but I can't prove that. You can't disprove it. You've got the thief that was saved, and on the other side you have one that was lost. Uh, and he called out to Jesus, and even though it looked like Jesus was hopeless, that he couldn't save anybody, Jesus, through his promise, saved that thief. He said, I'm telling you today, you will be with me in paradise. That's, a, that's awesome to see that picture. Yeah. Explained. And that's in Luke chapter 23. Why did the Roman soldier pierce the side of Jesus? When the report came, Joseph of Arimathea went to, um, Joseph was a very wealthy ruler. He went to Pilate, and it says he went boldly before Pilate, and he said, I would like to have the body of Jesus. And Pilate said, the body? Is he dead already? Because a Roman crucifixion could, could last days. Mm -hmm. And he was shocked that he had died already. And he told the soldiers, if, you know, if you're sure that he's dead, you can give this man the body. Well, the soldiers wanted to make sure he was not feigning death, and they pierced his side, uh, probably this side, because it, it seemed like it pierced his heart, to ensure that he was dead. And John records that from the wound came out two separate streams of blood and water. So they were just basically guaranteeing that he was dead. Uh, you would certainly flinch if you had your side pierced if you were alive. Well, there's also a prophecy about Jesus being That's pierced. That's right. Thank you. It says that um, they'll look upon him, Zechariah 12, they will look upon him whom uh, thou hast pierced. And it also tells us about his hands and feet being pierced in Psalm 22. It says they gambled for his clothing. It's amazing that these Psalms we know were written in the King David's example a thousand years before the event. These Psalms beautifully portrayed the crucifixion, and we know that the Bible's inspired because of that. It all points to Jesus. That's right. Were the two original covering cherubs, Lucifer and Gabriel, was Lucifer replaced? Maybe by Michael, the archangel, who was also Christ? Well, I'm not sure, but it's likely that Lucifer certainly held a very high position by the Lord. Uh, Gabriel may have been the other one. It does not say what the name is of the one who has replaced Lucifer. Uh, it does say in Isaiah 6 that there still are two angels on the right and the left of the Lord. When you get to Revelation, it talks about four creatures around the throne. It also mentions that in Ezekiel chapter 1. Um, you'll, in Catholic tradition, there's some extra biblical writings. They add an angel named Raphael. That's nowhere in the Bible. In the Bible, you have Gabriel. Michael is not a regular angel. Michael is called the archangel, and maybe you'll write a question in about that, but that's a whole different category. Why are there more prophets in the Old Testament, but not so many in the New Testament and in today's world? Well, the reason you'll find more prophets in the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Old Testament is covering roughly 4,000 years of history. So you've got prophets all the way from the time of Enoch up until Malachi. Uh, the New Testament is about 100 years of history. And so then you've got you know, several prophets in the New Testament. Each of the apostles would be considered a prophet. But you might be wondering, you know, how, how come we don't have any prophets from the Bible times to the present? Well, there's nothing that is added to Scripture from Bible times to the present, but it doesn't mean that the gift or the work of prophecy is gone. If you read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it tells us that gifts that God gave the church among teachers and administrators, it says, and prophets and pastors, and so the Bible looked down through time and said that God would still have a reason for people to use this gift of prophecy in the church, but that's not because it's to add to Scripture. The Scripture is complete. All right, and for our last question, why are God's words written in prophecies? Why is the Bible full of parables? Isn't there much greater value to people if it were just written plainly? Yeah, why did God write some of the parables? Now, some of the prophecies are very plain. Um, that one prophet told another prophet, he says, because you lied when you leave, a lion's going to eat you. That's what happened, a lion ate him. No misunderstanding that. <laughs> but then you've got prophecies when you get to the apocalyptic prophets, and that would be mostly Daniel, Zechariah, Ezekiel, Revelation. 
These prophecies were get, given while all of those characters were in a foreign country that was ruling. Some of their prophecies talked about the fall of Babylon and Persia and Rome. And in order to protect the messages, it was sort of given in code because you know, we've all seen governments that burn books in history. If they had known, if the Persians said that the Hebrews are foretelling that their God is going to overthrow our God, and they would have said, well, we're destroying those books. So part of the reason was to protect the books. Jesus also said, I'll speak in parables that the, um, if you seek, you'll find. Uh, some people will see and hear and not understand. But those who are searching, if you search for me, you'll find me when you search for me with all of your heart. And I trust that's what you're doing here and that's what you're doing, you who are watching. We pray you'll continue to come and I trust you're gonna be blessed in our program tonight. Amen. Thank you. All right, for tonight, we're gonna to be blessed with Pastor John Lomaking and Kelly Maurer and they're gonna be presenting No More Night. The timeless theme, earth and heaven will pass away. It's not a dream, God will make all things new that day. Gone is the curse. From which I stumbled and fell Evil has vanished into eternal Never 
Thank you, and Kelly and John. John still seems pretty good for an old guy. Bless his heart. Good evening, friends. So thankful for each of you that are here. I want to welcome those who are joining us, watching on television. You might be watching on AF Television, Amazing Facts TV, or Three Angels Broadcasting. Uh, we're so thankful to partner with Hope Channel for this series. We've got Better Life Television and a uh, number of networks that are carrying it, as well as Facebook and YouTube. And we're so neat to hear from people around the world, and we're also very thankful for our local audience. I want to encourage you, the lessons are available, and if you do the lessons along with the presentations, you will remember much more. And then you've got basically notes of the presentations you can use to give studies to your friends. And uh, that just helps the, the good news to spread. Amen? Our presentation tonight is dealing with the subject of the glorious kingdom. And we get to talk about heaven tonight. And of course, that is a, a wonderful subject, something that you find referenced in the Bible over 500 times. So it is a Bible subject. Some of the best material is found in the books of prophecy, namely the book of Revelation and also Daniel, Ezekiel, talks about this kingdom that God has prepared. But we always begin with a historical, some, one of these stories in the Bible that's an allegory for these biblical truths. The zenith in the time of Israel, they reached the, the high point in their history during the reign of Solomon. Uh, there was wars before and there were a lot of wars after, but they had 40 years of peace and incredible prosperity. The kingdom of Israel and Jerusalem in particular was one of the wonders of the world during the reign of Solomon. And you find this in your Bible in 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse also chapter 10, I should say. Solomon, after David died, he made an offering to the Lord at Gibeah. The Lord appeared to him during the night in a dream. And he said, uh, ask what I shall do for you. And it tells us that uh, God said, or he said to the Lord, uh, someone needs to help his brother right here. <laughs> he said, uh, let me go back and collect my thoughts here. <laughs> we have somebody who's fallen asleep. Maybe someone can help ar ar arouse that gentleman right here because that's going to be distracting. Thank you. <laughs> so he, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream, and Solomon said, uh, what should I ask for? He said, Lord, you made me king over this great empire, and I'm just a child. I don't know how to go out or to come in. Uh, give me a wise and understanding heart. And the thing the Lord asked for, please the Lord. A thing that Solomon asked for, please the Lord. And um, God said, look, you haven't asked for the death of your enemies, but I'm going to give you peace. You have not asked for money, but I'm going to make you wealthy. You have not asked for long life, but I'm going to give you long life, and I'm going to give you what you asked for. I'm going to give you great wisdom. During the time of Solomon's reign, the kingdom reached a zenith of prosperity. He built the temple, and this was a temple that was just plated with gold. It was one of the wonders of the world. Built a palace for himself. Uh, he got involved in international trade, very, very uh, intelligent. Well, he was a genius. And Solomon basically brought the kingdom to the point where it said that uh, Silver was counted as nothing. They were like stones in Jerusalem. Everything was gold. Jerusalem had turned into a golden kingdom. And during that time, the other nations were flowing unto uh, Israel to find out about their God. And you all remember the story in uh, 1 Kings chapter 10. It specifically mentions the Queen of Sheba, who came from a territory of either the southern Saudi Arabia or Africa. They're not sure exactly where. 
where uh, had incredible wealth. You've heard about the mines of Solomon, the lost mines of Solomon. They wondered if in northern Africa, somewhere where Sheba lived, that uh, they had these gold mines. And uh, Solomon had sent ships and brought back all this many talents of gold from this country. Um, but she came and she brought, you know, 40 camels loaded with gifts and treasures to give a gift to Solomon to ask about his wisdom. Now, this is what the Lord always wanted. He wanted the other nations of the world to come and to learn about God. God said to Israel, I want you to be a nation of kings and priests. And so this represented just the, a time of glory, a time of prosperity, a time of peace. There was no war. And it's a, the time on earth when the people of God were the closest to experiencing heaven on earth. But then it says, right after the Queen of Sheba, it says, but Solomon loved many women. And he took wives of the pagans that drew his heart away. I think it's interesting in the Bible, it says the Queen of Sheba, all the gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents. You find the number 666 there, right after that number 666 is mentioned, the kingdom goes down. It's interesting. But we're going to talk about heaven, and Solomon's early reign was sort of an allegory of that, but we like to go out on the street and find out what have people got to say, what are their thoughts about heaven? Is it real? Does heaven really exist? On a beautiful day like this, it seems like it does all around us. I suspect there's something beyond this, but uh, it's very hard to tell what it is. I like to think so, but I don't know for sure. I like to think so. My Buddhist philosophy would say no. Um, that uh, we're all part of the universe and when, we, when, when our energies leave our body, we just get reborn. I feel like it is. I feel like it's different interpretations of what heaven and hell could be. I think with a lot of people who think that heaven is like, oh, we're all going to be floating on clouds and stuff like that. Maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> but I think heaven biblically is forever being in the presence of the loving creator. Well, it's not like what we humans. Uh, this is earth, so this is flesh. So heaven is something um, invisible to humans. I say very peaceful, love. I mean, according to the Bible, it's streets of gold and things like that. I believe it'll be a new age. I, don't, I believe that it'll be rewarded. I believe that every second of every moment of every day from this point on matters in every one of our lives. It's going to be a place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no, no more weeping, no more of all the stuff that we're dealing with. The world that's broken is going to be fixed because God's going to be with us. Amen. You know, it's interesting that um, it seems like in North America, if you can believe the polls, that the number of people who believe in God is going down, but you still have about 75% of people in North America believe in heaven, whereas you only have about 23% that believe in hell. Isn't that interesting? And of the people that believe in heaven, 90% believe they're going there. Well, I believe the Bible teaches it is a real place. As I mentioned, it's referenced in the Bible over 500 times. Let's find out what the scriptures say about this subject and how it relates to Bible prophecy. First question, what did Jesus promise his people? You can read in John chapter 14, verse 2. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. So one thing we learn about heaven, and the word mansion here is dwelling place. Uh, God's, Jesus said, I'm going to prepare a dwelling place for you. He wants us to be with him. It's a tangible place in time. A lot of misconceptions about what heaven is, and we're going to find out what the Bible says about that. Um, he says he's prepared a mansion. So, you ever enjoy watching some of those programs about the, the homes of the rich? <laughs> you know, the most expensive home in the world is in Mumbai, India. And here, let me read you a couple of facts. I, I printed these off because I thought I might forget. Uh, one of the wealthiest people in the world owns this house. It's called the Antella, and it uh, was built by a multi-billionaire. He's worth about $45 billion, Mukesh Ambami. And um, it tells us that it's 550 feet high with 4 million square feet uh, of interior space. How'd you like to clean that? But that's not a problem for him. First six stories will be dedicated to parking lots, 186 parking places. 
uh, to pamper all the imported cars. 600 workers in this house. And if the traffic is bad, which it is in Mumbai, uh, he can land on the helicopter pad on the roof. Of course, it's got the pool. It's got the palatial rooms, 20 floors of palatial rooms, and, and um, a silver staircase. And if the guests get hot, which it gets very hot in that part of the country, there's a room that produces artificial snow to cool everyone off. So you go into the blizzard room, or whatever they call it there. And uh, <laughs> yeah, they've got a uh, panoramic view of the Arabian Sea. And this house costs approximately, or just under $2 billion a home. You know, the sad thing is you spend all that money on a home, and you're going to still get old and die. Man, the, the mansions that we might build here, they're not going to last. You're just going to leave it to somebody else. Jesus is preparing a place for us that will last forever. Amen? What do we know about the place Jesus is preparing? Isaiah 65, verse 17 says, Behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. I think most of us understand why we need a new earth. The Bible tells us this earth is waxing old like a garment. There's some serious problems. But uh, new heaven? What's wrong with the old heaven? You need to understand that when you find the word heaven in the Bible, uh, there's three different ways it describes heaven. The word is used three different ways. Now, some of you have heard of seventh heaven. The person says, I was in seventh heaven. There's no seventh heaven. The apostle Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, says that, uh, referring to himself, he says, I knew a man that was caught up to the third heaven, heard words that you're not even allowed to speak. And um, it's a real place, the dwelling place of God. The first time you find the word heaven, or what the Bible calls the first heaven, is the atmosphere around the earth where the clouds float and the birds fly. Uh, and um, when the Bible says the rain comes down from heaven, it's talking about the envelope of air around the earth. When God separated the waters above the earth from the waters below the earth, in Genesis, it's talking about the atmosphere. When uh, Captain Kirk, about a couple weeks ago, went to space, he had to escape the atmosphere around the earth, get out of its gravitational pull. So that first envelope is the first heaven. The second heaven is when you talk about the stars that God made in space, in the cosmos, in the universe. The third heaven is referring to um, the dwelling place of God, paradise. And so this is when Paul says, I was caught up to the third heaven. It's talking about there is an actual place where God dwells. Now, skeptics out there, they say, oh, you Christians, you say up in heaven. What do you mean? It's a round world. How could you say up in heaven? Well, technically, there is a deliberate spot in the universe. Some Christian astronomers believe it's somewhere in the constellation Orion because Orion is mentioned twice in the Bible. But uh, I don't know that. Uh, most think it's in the north because you realize north is a fixed point. The Bible says the devil wanted to sit on the sides of the north. And God, when he tells us in Leviticus, when they made their offerings towards the Lord, they did it on the north side, towards the Lord. So some have said, you know, we talk about up in heaven. Obviously, anything off the planet is up for us. But there is a place where the Lord dwells. Jesus is seated at the right hand of God. There's a heavenly temple. Study for another night. So God is talking about taking us to a real place. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, you might be also. We know when the Lord comes, says the dead in Christ rise, we are caught up, that's the rapture, to meet the Lord in the air, and he takes us to these mansions that he's prepared. But it doesn't stay there forever. Let's find out what the Bible says. It says he's prepared for them a city. He's prepared a city for them. Now, when I first read this and I thought, uh, God's going to take us to a city. That didn't really uh, float my boat because I've always wanted to run to the country. Uh, I've been in most of the major cities in the world. I was born in Los Angeles, grew up in New York City, lived with my mother for a while in England, lived in Boston, in Miami, been to Singapore and uh, uh, you name it, all over the world, Mumbai and Moscow, and Karen and I have traveled all over the world, and I just don't like cities. This week, we had a day off. Karen and I went up in the country where we were the only people probably in 10 miles. It was really nice to get out there in God's nature. 
But the reason that cities have a problem in this world is because in this world, you get people, and people sin, and where you got a lot of people, you got a lot of sin, and there's crime, and there's evil, and there's selfishness, and fighting, and murder, and all these problems. That's why cities are so bad here. But in heaven, you're not gonna have those problems. So when people get together there, it's gonna be beautiful, pure, rejoicing, no evil, no problems, no sin, no filth, no dirt. He's prepared a city. The media enjoys talking about heaven. Does heaven exist? And some people, when you say, picture heaven, you know what they see? They see little chubby naked babies with wings sitting on clouds, playing harps or shooting Cupid's arrows. And you know what I'm talking about? You got all these medieval pictures of people that say, yeah, I'm gonna die and I'm gonna go be a, a fat naked baby in heaven. And, and the media almost makes it sound like hell is more interesting. And trust me, it's not. And obviously, we're going to, Revelation talks about the lake of fire, and there's a chapter in there that deals with that. We're going to talk about that. I hope to inspire you first with a place where we want to think about, which is going to heaven. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the earth. Now, wait a second, Pastor Doug. I thought we just read that we're going up when Jesus comes. Here it says the meek will inherit the earth. It's because he's making a new heaven and a new earth. We're going to spend time with the Lord in these mansions he's prepared, and he is going to bring the new Jerusalem down from God. You read this in Revelation 21, out of heaven to the earth. But now we're getting ahead of ourselves. People have been trying to build heaven on earth, make a utopia on earth. I thought there was a fascinating experiment back in 1991. Some uh, scientists got together and they said, we're going to build a self-contained environment. They called it Biosphere 2. They figured the earth is Biosphere 1. We're going to make a perfectly self-contained environment where everything you need to live will be in there. The idea was if we can build this on Earth, maybe we can build one on the moon or on Mars or another planet. I told you opening night, thinking people all over the world know the world's not going to last, and they're directing their engineering genius to say, how can we exist on another planet? Can we create a self-contained environment that will perpetuate life? So they did this experiment. And in 1991, it was complete, cost about $200 million, had greenhouse, and they got waterfalls, and tried to have their own water purification. Well, the experiment went terribly bad. They were supposed to grow their own food. There were eight scientists that went in, supposed to stay in for a couple of years. They all began to fight, stealing food from each other, had friends smuggling in pizza. All the animals that they originally put in this uh, man-made Noah's Ark died off, except the cockroaches and the crazy ants had proliferated everywhere. So if there's a nuclear war, there will still be cockroaches and ants, you can almost guarantee. <laughs> and it just basically, the, the experiment totally failed. But um, they still have it there, and people take tours, and they look at it, and it, it sort of is a, um, a man-made uh, object masquerading as science. Man was not able to create utopia on Earth. So question number three, what more do we know about the holy city that God is preparing. You read, and there's a lot of details. Notice this is Revelation 21. It says, the city is laid out as a square. And he measured, measured the city with a reed. This is like we had tape measures they would measure with a reed back then. 12,000 furlongs. The measurements are given in uh, this English equivalent or biblical numbers. By our standards, that would be the city is about 1,500 miles around or you can figure 375 miles on each side. It's about the size of the state of Oregon. So if you're wondering, will there be room for me? Yes, there will be room for you. I used to live, as I mentioned, in New York City. Do you know there are more people that live below street level in New York City than in the whole state of Wyoming? At least that used to be true. Now everyone in California is moving to Wyoming, so I don't know if that's still true. But um, New York City, another amazing fact, I landed at the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, and someone said, you want to hear something? I said, what? I said, the Dallas-Fort Worth Airport is bigger than the island of Manhattan. I thought, no. I looked it up. It's true. It's just the airport in Dallas. Everything's bigger in Texas, right? New York City, 8 million people. And so if you've got a city that's 375 miles on each side, is there room for you? Some folks have actually thought, no sense trying to go to heaven. You know, I'm just too late in line. There's just so many people. How God, God going to fit me in there? 
I promise you that will not be the problem. The harvest is great. The laborers are few. The Lord wants people to enter the city. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. And so it's almost like it's a cube. Now, the height of it equal to the length and the breadth? When you look at that, and this is something of a puzzle for theologians, does that mean that in the middle of the city it sort of goes up like, shaped like a pyramid where it's 375 miles jutting right out of the atmosphere of the earth? That's hard to imagine. As I go through what the Bible tells us about heaven, and it seems like I'm getting a little carried away, I promise you I cannot get carried away enough. Because Paul tells us, the eye has not seen, the ear has not heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. In other words, you can't imagine it. We have some things the Bible tells us about heaven, wonderful things, but it's going to be so much better than anything we can understand. John says in chapter 21 of Revelation, verse 2, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. So there's a time when it comes down from heaven and sets here, settles on the earth. Revelation 21, verse 10 and verse 12, He carried me away in the Spirit to a great and a high mountain, and He showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem. Now, the word Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it means city of peace. The earthly Jerusalem has been destroyed and rebuilt 27 times. And when you go see Jerusalem today, they still have the ancient wall that is full of pockmarks from bullet holes and arrows and missiles and stones that were thrown against the walls. You get the evidence of war everywhere. And the people in Jerusalem today, you've got the Jewish quarter and you've got the Muslim quarter and you've got the Armenian quarter and you've got the Christian quarter and everybody's got their space and there's incredible racial tension in the city. But the New Jerusalem is going to be very different from that. Everybody is going to be part of one family and we'll all love each other. Descending out from heaven from God, it had a great and a high wall with 12 gates. Number that's going to continue to appear as you look at the New Jerusalem is the number, who knows? 12. You've got 12 gates, 12 foundations. You've got uh, Tree of Life has 12 kinds of fruit, 12 times a year. It's 12,000 furlongs. Now, why the number 12? 12 is a number that God uses for his church. He had 12 patriarchs in the Old Testament, 12 apostles in the New Testament. There are 12 minor prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, 12 is also mathematically an excellent number for builders. Any of you men or women, if you've done any building, 12 is, there's a reason it's 12 inches in a foot. By the way, it's a fun fact. You know, for years, the measurement of the foot changed every year. It depended on the size of the king's foot. It so happens my foot is exactly one foot. And so when I go measure anything out and someone says, I wonder how far that is, I says, wait, I'll tell you. And I just go like this, and it's right on every time. So when they got a new king, if they had a king with a little foot, it messed everybody up. But they always tried to keep it where they're 12 inches in the foot because 12 is divisible by one, by two, by three, by four, by six, and by 12. And so when you're building and you use the number 12, it's like the perfect construction number. John's a fisherman. He wasn't an architect. He got this information from God. Just like God gave Noah the plans for the ark and they found out the dimensions, the ratio of the ark, it's the same ratio they use for oil tankers. It's a very stable ratio. How did Noah know that? They had no oceans back then. God is the master architect. Can you say amen? amen. Twelve gates. And the construction of its wall was of jasper. Something else you'll notice as we look at the different minerals, and let's read Revelation 21, verse 12. And the street of the city was pure gold. You were still with me? You've heard of the golden streets? It's real. Now, that's why some people say, oh, now this has just got to be a metaphor. Well, the Bible says it's better than you can imagine. I mean, we pave our streets with asphalt or stone. And God has no shortage of gold. You realize he made it. He can make as much as he wants. He's got the factory. And so it's not a problem for him. Don't underestimate what God can do. The other thing is that um, you want streets that are durable. One of the most durable minerals they have is gold. When they found King Tut's tomb, 
uh, was it 1922, Howard Carter, he looked inside and he shone a light in there. And they said, do you see anything? And he looked at the undisturbed tomb. The seal had not been broken to the king's burial and the glint of gold was everywhere because even after 3,000 years, the gold was still shining. It's an incredible material. You don't notice there's any wood. Nothing has to die in this city to build. God is making it out of minerals. What does the Bible say about the city's water and food supply? Answer, he showed me a pure river, a water of life. You know, Jesus, he offers us that water of life. He told the woman at the well, you're coming for this water, but you're going to get thirsty again. But the water that I'm offering you, you drink it, and it will be inside you as an artesian well that will continue to spring up and satisfy your thirst. She said, oh, Lord, give me that water now. He revealed to her he was the Messiah. By the way, the Lord is offering you that living water. You can also read, even in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about a river. And now how big is the river? You read in Ezekiel, when he's describing the river in heaven, he says he walked out into it, and he goes out like, you know, 100 yards, and it's up to his ankles, and he keeps going out, and it's up to his knees, and he keeps going out, and it's up to his thighs, and it just keeps going and going, and it gets deeper and deeper, and then finally he said it's a river that one cannot cross without swimming. So think of the biggest rivers that we have in the world today. Uh, the longest is the Amazon, though the people in Africa argue because there's some technicalities about how they measure. Uh, otherwise, it would be the Nile. Karen and I, a couple of years ago, were in uh, Uganda. We went to the source of the Nile River. That was really something. And uh, these long rivers, these Amazon pushes fresh water out into the ocean 100 miles. It's got so much water coming out of it. At its mouth, the Amazon, the Mississippi, they're miles wide. So when you get to heaven and there's a river that is irrigating the planet, how big do you think it is? Think big. Picture for a minute a river that's 50 miles across and flowing from the throne of God. How big is God? So there'll be no drought in heaven. We're going to have plenty of water. <laughs> you know, for those that are watching here in California, water is a sensitive issue. Uh, it's, we're, we're getting more and more regulation about water because it seems like you know, we've had droughts and there's been a shortage and it's so nice when you go somewhere and you can turn on the tap and just let it run because the water's just bubbling out of the ground. And uh, there'll be an abundance of water. You'll be able to wash your car every day if you want to in heaven. And won't have to worry about rationing. Amen? So there's going to be that river of life. What about the food? On either side of the river, now notice carefully, either side of the river was the tree, singular, not trees, the tree of life. Always in the Bible when it talks about the tree of life, and it's mentioned several places, it's singular a tree on both sides of the river. How do you reconcile that? Well, they actually have some trees that will grow together in their branches. I've seen it before. Trees that grow up, the branches touch, they actually graft themselves together, they grow together. And I picture this massive tree, if the river's 50 miles wide, you better figure a big tree. Of course, everybody in the world's got to eat from this tree, so it's got to be big. And roots probably go together under the river. And uh, it has the fruit that helps perpetuate life. Man has not eaten from that tree since God evicted Adam and Eve from the garden, but it will be restored. You know, one of the wonderful things about the Bible is in the first three chapters of the Bible, you learn how man lost eternity because he got mixed up with a snake in a garden. First three chapters, man is evicted from the garden. You get to Revelation, the snake is destroyed, and man is restored to the garden and the tree of life in the last three chapters. The whole book is telling us how to get back to the garden. Amen? And it's through Jesus. It says the seed of the woman is the one who will destroy the serpent. That actually happens in Revelation. It tells us that this is some kind of tree. Each tree yields its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Now, people say, well, first of all, it's fruit every month. And if there's 12 different kinds of fruit and there's 12 months in a year, how many kinds of fruit is that? 12 times 12, 144. Another number you're going to find is the 144,000. I used to work at Baskin Robbins. Baskin Robbins is famous for what? 31 flavors. And they've got way more than 31 flavors. They promised to have 31 flavors at all time. At least they did when I worked there. They got hundreds of flavors. 
whatever your favorite food is, there will be some fruit that you're really going to like there at the tree. The menu will never get boring. And we're going to gather and you can say, oh, try this. It's like salsa. You're going to like this fruit. And everyone's going to be, I like salsa. You're going to be tasting all kinds of different fruit. But then it says the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Healing? I thought there's no more sickness. Who needs healing? Does it say healing of sickness or healing of nations? Nations. Do you realize that people all around the world are divided now by nations? People are divided by culture, race, language. But as we all come together as the children of God, redeemed by Christ around that tree and eat the fruit, all of the divisions that have separated us are healed at that point. Can you say amen? And so it's, it's a beautiful poetic way of saying everyone is going to be healed of all the divisions from this earth. A little amazing fact about trees, this is a baobab tree in Africa. It's in Africa, it's in Australia, it's in Madagascar. They call it the tree of life because during the rainy season it soaks up lots of water and during the dry season it provides animals with water. They usually dig holes in it. They're able to get the spongy pulp and get water out of it. It's got fruit called monkey bread that you can eat. The pollen turns into a glue. The, fab, the bark can be made into a tea. They also use the plant to make uh, cloth and uh, the leaves can be used to make material. It's just uh, the tree does so many different things. It's like the coconut tree. The pilots during World War II, they said, if you got shot down in the Pacific, try and get to an island with coconut trees because it is a tree of life. And I know I've been to a lot of South Pacific islands and it's amazing to me. Not only do they make baskets from the leaves, you can make soap, you can make butter, you can drink the milk, the water from the coconut will keep you alive. There's food, you get the coconut meat. There's all kinds of things you can do with the coconut tree. Tree of life, much more important. It provides something that perpetuates life. So our cells right now, when you're young, you heal, you regenerate. But we're missing something because as we get older, we're not supposed to die. Just want to pause and get you to think about something. Every desire that people have, every normal desire, God has created a way for that desire to be satisfied. You get hungry, you eat food. God has created desires for companionship, you've got people. God has created us with a desire for intimacy in marriage. There's a way for that to be satisfied appropriately. Every per, uh, group of people around the world, we've all been uh, given from birth a desire to live. We feel like we're supposed to live. Uh, people avoid death at all costs. It's because God designed us to live forever. Death is not part of his plan. And one of the last things that's thrown in the lake of fire is death. That is not God's will. Number five, how will living in heaven be different than living here on earth? There's a lot of beautiful uh, uh, examples here. Here's some specifics. It tells us in Isaiah 35, verse 5, then the eyes of the blind will be opened. Blind people are going to be able to see beautifully. And in heaven, you know, whatever your vision is now, it's going to be infinitely better. You know, eagles can see three miles away. They can see a mouse. They got like telescopic vision. You will have much better vision in heaven. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. You'll be able to hear a rustle in the grass like an elephant from a mile away. You know, Superman had special hearing. I wasted my childhood, sorry. <laughs> You'll be able to hear everything. And it tells us that the, the lame man will leap like a deer. People in this life who are limping around and they're weak and they're lame, they're going to have incredible strength and they're going to be able to leap and jump. You read also it says, and they will not hurt or destroy. It talks about the animals are going to all be kind to each other. A child will play on the hold of a venomous serpent and it will not hurt. The wolf will lay down with the lamb. You've heard these verses before, right? In the Bible. And nothing is going to hurt or destroy in all of his holy mountain. Got a little amazing fact for you. Several years ago, some uh, drug agents, they went into the, uh, the apartment or the mansion of this drug lord, and he was busted. And in his basement, he had a lion, a bear, and a tiger cub. He, cub. he had a lot of money. Now, I don't know if you know that uh, Escobar, 
who was the drug kingpin there in Colombia, he had his own zoo. I don't know what it is with these drug guys, they liked animals. So this guy, he had a, a cub, a bear cub, a lion, and a tiger, and they were in terrible squalor in the basement. But they seemed to get along with each other. And so when they finally, they said, the police said, what do we do with these, you know? There was a group that had an animal shelter called Noah's Ark or something, and they took these animals in, and they remained friends. They called them BLT, for bear, tiger, uh, bear, lion, tiger. Kind of like the Wizard of Oz, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, right? But it's real. And they play together, and they, they fight every now and then. They eat together. When they go to sleep at night, they all curl up together. And you think, well, normally, in their normal habitat, they'd be enemies. In heaven, the animals will not kill each other. And everybody's going to be a vegetarian there in heaven. We're not going to be, you know, chasing down chickens and cutting off their heads and making McNuggets out of them. And so we're going to be eating from the tree of life. The wolf also will dwell with the lamb, and a little child will lead them. So nothing dies in this kingdom. There is no more death. The desert shall blossom as a rose. You know, there's going to be places that will be of intense beauty, and there'll be places that will be of wonderful beauty. There'll be no deserts where there is no life. Even the deserts there will blossom as the rose. The inhabitant will not say, I am sick. Oh. You say amen to that. We're just surrounded by news all the time of people being sick and being overcome by a disease or viruses or bacteria. Nobody's going to get sick. Nobody will die. You'll be in perfect health and vitality all the time. Won't that be wonderful? And the best news, it says there'll be no more death. No one needs to worry or live in fear about death. No more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. The former things are passed away. All things are made new. So, in heaven, are we going to be resurrected as ghosts playing harps? What, what's it going to be like? It sounds like we're living in real places. Jesus is making a mansion for us. It sounds like there's real animals in the new earth. What kind of bodies do the saints have? The Bible tells us. Philippians chapter 2, I'm sorry, Philippians 3, verse 20 and 21. The Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it might be conformed to his glorious body. So here it's referring to the kind of body that Jesus had when he rose from the dead. That leads us into our next question. Is Jesus' body real or is he a spirit? Let's let the Bible explain this. When Jesus rose from the dead, that uh, Sunday evening, he appeared in the upper room to his disciples, and he said, all hail, and they worshiped him, and they were scared. They thought that they saw a ghost. And he said, I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spirit. A spirit does not have flesh and bone that you see that I have. He said, behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me, touch me, he's saying. See, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. He gave them every evidence he could probably present that he was real. Then after he said this, he said, now that I think about it, I'm hungry. He said, can you get me something to eat? And it tells us that, the, that they gave him some broiled fish and the honeycomb, something to eat, and he ate. So what other encouraging promises found in the Bible? Other encouraging promises that we can look at. Speaking of heaven, Acts chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 and that he might send Jesus Christ, whom the heavens must receive until the restoration of all things. So if you want to know something about heaven, just keep in mind that what God is going to do is he is going to restore his original plan. God is going to make things at least as good as they were, if not better. And people talk about, well, are we going to eat in heaven? I'll say, well, did Adam and Eve eat? That was part of his plan. He's going to restore that. Are we going to be able to, you know, run around? Can we talk to God? Did Adam and Eve talk to God? Yeah. We'll be able to talk to angels the way I'm talking to you. You know, there's angels in this room right now. They're real. And when Adam and Eve sinned, one of the consequences of sin was Adam and Eve lost a dimension of their existence. See, up until um, that time, Adam and Eve could commune with angels the way you and I are talking to each other now. And, but when they sinned, they lost that whole spiritual dimension. That will be restored. 
but that doesn't mean they stop being physical creatures. They will have the physical plus the spiritual in addition. Restoration of all things, God's original plan. I know sometimes uh, I'll be renting a car when I travel, and uh, you know, I, I'll rent the, um, the economy of the mid-sized car, whatever it is, and I'll get there, and the agent at the desk will say, you know, we've had some bad weather, and so I've got some good news, and I've got some bad news. I said, all right, let me have the bad news. Uh, we don't have your car. I said, oh, what's the good news? They say, we're going to give you an upgrade. We do have a car, but we don't have your model. I remember one time I was in St. Louis, and I went to the counter to get my rental car. It's actually on my way to 3ABN to do some recording. And the gal that met me there, she looked at me and she goes, are you on television? I said, yeah, I yes, I am. Yeah. And, and I'm always happy when people see the program. She said, oh, I watch your programs all the time. And there's no one else there. I got in late. She said, I'm going to give you an upgrade. She said, how'd you like a convertible? And I looked out the window. I said, it's snowing. <laughs> she said, oh, I don't know what I was thinking. She said, we'll give you, we'll give you the, um, the executive Cadillac. And I thought, well, you know, that might not look good if I get the executive Cadillac, but I really wanted to, I said, well, thank you very much. I wanted to be a pre, thank you. So they gave me this, this new Cadillac at the same price as my car, I'll have you know. I'm a pastor and we stay on a budget. And so then I drive to the church where I'm supposed to speak and I think, oh no, everybody's going to see me pull up to this, car, this church in this Cadillac. And so I got to the farthest part of the parking lot that I could and I kind of waited until I thought that everybody had wandered in so I could jump out. I jumped out and I went to lock the car. I pressed the alarm. <laughs> and I went, burr, burr, burr. everybody turns and looks at me trying to turn off my Cadillac. So the Lord has a sense of humor. But anyway, God's going to give us an upgrade when we get to heaven. Those who maybe can't sing now, you'll be able to sing there, right? Whatever you might be lacking in this life, he's going to compensate in the new earth. Everything's going to be restored or better. Who's going to be there? It says, these are the ones who follow the lamb wherever he goes. You want to be in that kingdom? Who's going to be there? 144,000. It says they follow the lamb wherever he goes. Now, here's a simple principle. If you want to follow the lamb there then, you must first follow him here now. Amen. You will not be able to follow him there then if you don't learn to follow him here now. Jesus says to each one of us what he said to the apostles, follow me. Follow his teachings. He wants us to spend time with him. Will any sad or painful memories from this life trouble people in heaven? No. The Bible says the former will not be remembered nor come into mind. Now, that doesn't mean that God brainwashes us so we forget that Jesus has redeemed us. You know, even in the resurrection, when Jesus showed himself to his disciples, did he still have the scars in his hands? He did. So there'll always be that reminder of what Jesus did to die for us and that he sacrificed his life for us, but uh, we're not going to have any of the painful memories. I don't know about you, but I, I frequently, my mind wanders and I go back and sometimes I think about things that I've done and I just sigh and I have my regrets. And even though I know the Lord's forgiven me, I think, oh, Doug, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? And you still got it in your mind. As you enter eternity, how many of you know that it's true that time heals? As you enter eternity and you get away from the pain of this world, you know, after the first million years, you're not going to worry about it anymore. You'll never forget that Jesus redeemed you. This then connects with another important question that people ask about heaven. It says, will the people from earth recognize each other in God's new kingdom? Answer, then I shall know just as I am known. I have folks say all the time, um, you know, grandma, when she died, she was kind of old and wrinkled, and when I get to heaven, she's got her new body. How will I ever find her? She can be this beautiful woman in perfect age, and we're going to be looking everywhere for Grandma that we love so much, and there's going to be so many people there. How will I ever find Grandma? Friends, don't worry about that. What do you think? When you get to heaven, are you going to have enhanced discernment or diminished discernment? You're going to have the Spirit of God. You will have enhanced discernment. 
you're going to know your friends. The Bible says, then we will know even as we are known. And it's going to be fun to see our loved ones and be reunited there and to see them. Sometimes we see our loved ones, they die painfully. I remember many times being at the bed of some saint that was passing away, often with sickness, and, and I said, you know, just keep in mind, your next conscious thought when you open your eyes is going to be the resurrection, the face of God, and a glorified eternal body. Won't that be wonderful? And of course, it's going to be wonderful. Number 11, what thrilling promises does God give us regarding his coming kingdom? Answer, the ransomed of the Lord will come to Zion with singing and with everlasting joy. Everything is going to be wonderful there. And how long will our joy last? One of Karen's favorite verses is in Psalm 16 where it says, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Uh, the words to describe heaven, the human language is inadequate for us. You use the words like bliss and splendor and uh, just the, the joy that's going to be there. God did not create creatures to torture them. God is not a sadist. God loves his children and he wants to bless them. But because of our freedom, we've made choices that have brought all of this heartache. Because of his love, he wants to save us from that and restore us to his original plan. If you want to know what God wants for you, look in the first few verses of the Bible. When God made Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden after those days of creation, what does it say? It was good. God saw what he did. Good. Good. Second day, third day, fourth day. Good, 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 good. Finally, it says very good. The Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from God. In fact, in English, the word we use for God is connected with the word good. Like when you say good day, you can say have a God day with uh, somebody. And so God wants to bless you. He's not wanting to spoil you, but he wants his creatures to be happy. He wants us to have joy. And the greatest joy is going to be in his presence. At his right hand are pleasures. This is a verse I just quoted you. Psalm 16, verse 11. And at his right hand are pleasures, how long? Forevermore. The Bible tells us that the streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing. Now, um, people often ask, will there be children in heaven? So if, if grandma dies and she's resurrected, she's not old and wrinkled, she's got perfect eternal vigor and youth. It says, we will run and not be weary, we'll walk and not faint. Um, and so we're going to have that energy, that youth. But what about a baby or a child that dies? Or when they're young, if Jesus comes and they're caught up during the translation, do they suddenly turn into adults? No, there's going to be children in heaven. You read in Malachi chapter 4, and it tells us that they will go forth and grow up. Now, frankly, I think they'll grow more slowly. Um, and I think I've mentioned that when, if you were here every night during one of the Bible question times, you look, and in Genesis, it's telling about the patriarchs. They lived hundreds of years. Some of them didn't get married until they were over 100 because it seemed like they just grew more, slow, more slowly back then. So we'll get to enjoy them growing up. The streets of the city will be full of boys and girls playing. Now today, if you're downtown, you don't tell your children, go play in the street. But in heaven, you'll tell them, go play in the street. Uh, don't have to worry about them getting run over by a, a drunk driver or anything like that. There's going to be plenty of room in the new earth because just think about it, all the room we're going to save with no cemeteries. More and more people are, are using cremation because the cities are running out of real estate for cemeteries. And someone may have a question about that. There'll be no golf courses. I just made a lot of enemies. I don't know that there won't be any. There's no police, no morticians, no doctors, no lawyers, right? Because there's no law. There's no prisons, no hospitals. Think about all the space that we're going to save in heaven. It says, they'll run and not be weary. They will walk and not faint. And so God doesn't want us to uh, ever have to worry about fatigue. Now, some are going to ask, and you may put it in as a question, will we sleep in heaven? I think we're going to be able to rest and sleep, but it's not going to be the sleep of someone who's exhausted. It's going to be the sleep of someone who is just satisfied and resting 
and uh, it will be just regenerating every day. But um, it says we're going to run and not be weary. Will we be able to fly? A question that often comes in is, will we have wings? Are we able to fly? You have this verse in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. They will mount up with wings like eagles. And so I think, yes, we will be able to fly. Man is not going to be quarantined on this planet. Everything that God made in creation, he wants us to enjoy. I can't prove it, but I've got a theory. Adam and Eve were able to see underwater. You know, a penguin, it can go down a thousand feet and it can see. Its eyes, it's got the most incredible eye. Its eye can dilate so that it can see squid a thousand feet down in the blackness. And that same penguin gets up on the brilliant ice in summer and its pupil dilates so it can see on the ice. And its eyes can adjust for water and its eyes can adjust for air. I think Adam and Eve, God made all these beautiful creatures underwater. I think they were able to hold their breath and go down and look at what God made down there. I think we're going to be able to fly with the birds. I think we're going to, how many of you ever sung that song, Rock of Ages? It says, when we soar to worlds unknown. I think that's biblical. I think we're not going to be quarantined on this planet. There's a place in Job, it says, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came from the earth. Here's this heavenly meeting, the leaders of other worlds. We'll be able to go to those conventions in the galaxies. And I think we can't even imagine it, which is our next question. Can we adequately describe God's new kingdom with words? No. The eye has not seen, nor the ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. You know, I just, uh, last year I read a book. I'd done it before, but I read a book on Marco Polo. And as a young man, he went with his father, like 17 years old, to China, which was this massive empire, credible technology, and millions and millions of people. And it was so much more sophisticated and bigger than what he had left in Europe. He came back after 20, 25 years living in the Orient and traveling the world, and he started to tell the stories of what was happening in China talked about this wall that was, you know, a thousand miles long. They said, a thousand miles. You're exaggerating. Talked about gunpowder. Talked about paper money. Talked about all the incredible things and the inventions that they had. When he lay dying, it's true, he lay dying, the priest came to him and asked him to confess before it was too late. They said, you're soon going to meet God. You told all these lies about the land of China. Don't you think it's time that you confess and repent? And he kind of sat up and looked at him and said, repent. He says, I've not told you the half of what I've seen. That's always how I feel like during this sermon, is I'm not able to tell you a fraction of what it's like. But we need to be excited about heaven, friends, because if you believe that's where you're going, for one thing, it makes the sins of this world less attractive. Everybody lives in a particular way when you're getting ready to take a trip. When Karen and I were getting ready to go to Russia, we were going to be there six weeks after the Iron Curtain fell to do public evangelism. For the first time in 70 years, we could preach about Christ. We got a tape. We tried to learn some Russian words. I can say a few things. But um, learned about the language, learned about the food, ate a lot of borscht. I learned how to say ice cream. That was essential. Morojene learned about the dress, learned about the climate, and we are so excited about this trip. If you're getting ready to go to heaven, you know they talk different there. God, you want God to sanctify your lips now, don't you? They dress different there, we should dress like Christians. They think different there, we should be pure in heart. And so we ought to be preparing for that new kingdom, amen? What's the highest reward in God's new kingdom? Revelation 21, verse 3, God himself will be with them. What a wonderful promise. The best news of all, we will be in the presence of God. Better than the golden streets or being able to slide down the neck of a giraffe or being able to, you know, see all the, the splendor is the presence of God, God himself. We've been separated from God by our sins. We'll be reunited in that kingdom. What will exclude people from God's heavenly kingdom? You read in Revelation 21, verse 27, there shall by no means enter into it anything that defiles. You see, Jesus came to save us from our sin. Isaiah tells us in Ezekiel, Satan was cast out of heaven for sinning. We are not going in sinning. Now, I know we all struggle with sin, 
but you need to experience that new birth, a transformation that Jesus is offering you, where you've got the new mind, and you can have that, friends. Believe it's possible. Jesus would not do what he did to save you if it wasn't possible for you to be saved. He who overcomes will inherit all things. He's promised all this to you. How much better is eternity than this short life? How much better eternity in that world than the misery and suffering in this life? He's offering to you that as a gift. You cannot sell out eternity for this little grain of sand here. You've all seen it before where if you tell a kid, I'll give you $100 tomorrow or an ice cream cone today. I said, I want the ice cream cone now. And that's what we do. We trade eternity for just a bag of beans. What can I do about sin? The Bible promises that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If you do that, Jesus promises that he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When you pray that prayer, you ask Jesus into your heart, then at that point, you are on your way to heaven. Heaven is your home. Jesus wants you to be at the wedding feast of the Lamb. He's prepared a mansion for you, and he's paid the price for you to be there, friends. Don't you want to go? Isn't that your desire? What did Jesus say was a formula for success in this life and the next life? Here's the key. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and everything else you need in this world will be taken care of. Your priority should be seeking after the place and eternity he's prepared for you. You know, I'd like to pray with you before we close, and I want to invite John to come up at this time, and Kelly, he's going to share a few verses from a familiar song, and I'd like you to be praying as he sings and as Kelly plays and say, is there anything in your life right now as an obstacle to eternity? And say, Lord, save me from that. Set me free and help me to know that my name is in the book of life. He will do that for you. When all my labors and trials are over, and I am safe on that beautiful shore Just to be near the dear Lord I adore Will through the ages be glory for me Oh, that will be glory for me Glory for me, glory for me, when by His grace I shall look on His face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Listen. Friends will be there I have loved long ago Joy like a river around me will flow Yet just a look from the Savior I know Will through the ages be glory for me Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me, when by His grace I shall look on His face, that will be glory, be glory for me. Don't you want to look on his face in peace? The Bible is good news. The gospel is good news. I heard one day about a, uh, a father who finally agreed that for a boy's birthday, he said, okay, we're going to get you a puppy. So he took him down to the local, what we used to call the ASPCA, the pound, and uh, they had a pretty good assortment of dogs. And the boy went in there, and they had some purebreds that had been abandoned. 
her and somebody had had too many puppies and they couldn't take care of it. And there were German shepherds and there were Doberman pinchers and there were dachshunds and there were huskies and they had all of these fine dogs in this city kennel. And the boy went over to the cage of this little mongrel that was there yapping and wagging his tail furiously. He said, Dad, I want that one. He said, you want that one? You want that mutt? He said, yeah. He said, well, what about the, the, the shepherd over here, the collie? This is a beautiful collie, like Lassie. Don't you want Lassie? I said, no, I want that one. He said, why do you want that one? He looked at his wagging tail and he said, he's got a happy ending. <laughs> the Bible has a happy ending, friends. The Bible tells us that God is going to create a world where there is no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, no more death. The former things will not come into mind and we'll be able to live in the presence of Jesus. You'll be able to look through the ceaseless ages into an eternity where you know that you can live forever. Don't you want to be part of that? The only thing that will keep us out is letting the devil distract us with the cares of this life. And that's what, it's, that's what his mission is. The devil is just trying to distract us with things that don't matter. The Bible says we become preoccupied with the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We become preoccupied with trying to build a kingdom down here. The devil offered that to Jesus. He said, you fall down and worship me and I'll give you the world. And Jesus said, no, I'm going to get the world, but not the way you're offering it to me. I'm going to get it by shedding my blood and redeeming this planet. The Lord is going to restore his original plan. This world is going to once again be a paradise, a new heavens and a new earth, and he wants you to be there. But you need to just come to Jesus and trust him. I think all of us know there's a 100% death rate in the world, and uh, our only hope is the eternity that God has prepared for us. And the things that you learn in this life, you take into eternity. The good that you do, the decisions you make, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. That's why we need to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Can I pray with you as we close? Loving Lord, we're so thankful for this message and the good news you promise in your word, a world where there's gonna be just splendor and glory, your presence, your light radiating through the whole planet. There'll be joy. The Garden of Eden will be restored and we'll be able to live with our loved ones through ceaseless ages, Lord. I pray that you'll help each of us to seek first your kingdom, to make Jesus and your word our priority. Forgive our sins. Prepare us for that day. We thank you and pray in Christ's name. Amen. Now, friends, before you go, before we bid farewell to our friends that are watching, when is our next meeting? No, no meeting tomorrow night. For those that are watching live, it's going to be Friday night. We're going to be talking about one of the most important issues that divides the world. We also have a uh, study guide. It's called The Commands of the King that you're going to be receiving. And if you want to come Saturday morning, I'll be sharing my personal testimony, talking about the Word of God. We look forward to seeing you all then. God bless you, and thank you very much. Amen.